Welcome. My name is Olivia Mattis. I'm president of the Souza Mendez Foundation, devoted to perpetuating the memory of the Holocaust rescuer Aristides de Souza Mendez. Oh, and for the past 20 or so weeks, we have been showing you stories of rescue and heroism from different aspects of Holocaust history. And today we're going to pull those strands all together and we're going to discuss the fundamental question of what makes a hero. We saw this fabulous film by Yoav Shamir, whom we're privileged to have with us here today from Israel, where they're about to go on lockdown. And we have here in the US two experts. We have Dr. Eva Fogelman, who is a psychologist, an author, and uh, an authority on the altruistic personality. We have Dr. Mordecai Paldiel, who is a historian, who was for 25 years director of the Department of the Righteous at Yad Vashem, and who knows all about the history of rescue. So we'll approach this topic from several angles. Uh, today, the idea is it's going to be a very interactive program, so you are very much encouraged to put your questions and comments into the chat box and be part of the conversation. Today's program will be moderated by Dr. Fogelman, so let me uh, let me throw the program to her for some initial words, and then we're going to see a couple of little film clips and then have our discussion. So, Dr. Fogelman, how are you today? Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for tuning in and to Olivia for setting up uh, this uh, magnificent film for everybody to uh uh, to appreciate and uh, that we will have an opportunity to discuss with people who really devoted a lot of time to trying to understand what makes a hero. We're very thrilled to have Yoav Shamir with us, uh, who's a award-winning film cinematographer, director, and producer who studied film at Tel Aviv University. He is often described as a rare documentary filmmaker who's fearless and willing to show us the uncomfortable truth about the world we live in. His incredible, bold, and daring spirit has taken him to Cuba, where he filmed Marta and Luis Valdez, who in the 1960s were musical stars, and now in their cities were striving in oblivion. A few years later, in 2003, Yoav takes us to the realities of Checkpoint, that Palestinians have to pass between Israel and the West Bank, where he served for three years while in the Israeli army. In 2005, he documented five days, Israel's disengagement from the Gaza Strip. In 2007, Yoav takes us to India, where many Israeli backpacks after serving in the Israeli army, of which he was one of them. The rampant drug use that uh, many experience at times causes psychotic breaks, which we see in Yoav's film, Flipping Out. With the rise of anti-Semitic incidents, the media keeps blitzing words such as Holocaust, Nazi, and anti-Semitism. Yoav travels to New York to meet a Foxman and the staff of the Anti-Defamation League to unearth what's behind all these headlines. Defamation also follows senior Israeli high school students as they go on their uh, annual trip. Today, there are about 35 Israeli high school students who go to a pilgrimage to see concentration camps in Poland, and we'll get to see what their impact and this trip has on them. There's much more I can say about Yoav, who also started a production company to help other filmmakers and serve others in producing films. Dr. Morichai Paldiel is probably familiar to many of you since he's been on quite a few of the other programs for the Sousa de Mendes Foundation. Uh, he is the expert on the rescue of Jews during the Holocaust. He's familiar, uh, as I said, to all of us here. But our, my path with him crossed in 1984 uh, when he started working as the director of Hasidei Umot Olam 
and from which he retired 25 years later. His dedication to honor uh, those Jew, non-Jews who risked their lives to save Jews during the Holocaust, I have to say, is very exemplary. After retiring, he came to the United States and had a totally new career in which he was uh, teaching at Stern College, Queens College, Stockton, among others. He also is a very prolific writer and speaker. He's written about nine books uh, from uh, on rescuers, ordinary rescuers, to diplomats, to the role of the church, and most importantly, Jews who rescued other Jews. I'm very grateful that our paths have crossed and we continue to appreciate each other over these many years. So now, Olivia, would you like to show us a clip? Two days ago, another life was saved when Wesley Autry jumped in front of a moving train to help a stricken man who'd fallen onto the subway tracks. When I entered with my two daughters, I noticed a young man uh, falling out on the platform. His hands and legs are shaking and kicking. He was having a seizure. He landed there. I jumped down there and I ran up to him. And the train was coming this, this way and I bear hugs him like this, and I looks over his shoulder, and I push him backwards, and both of us went down right, right in that gutter there. And as we was going down, by me being on top, the first train car just grazed my hat. Well, the first question I think you have to ask yourself if you're not an egoist is why? Why live for other people? You know, you have one life, this is it, this is all there is, what reason could ever be given for you to live for the group, for somebody you don't know, for, for, you know, for a, a history or for a future that you won't know either? Uh, so I don't get the arguments, any of the arguments for it, I think, are either based on emotion. Or I've never heard a rational argument for why I should live for the sake of other people. Two snippets that you saw are, you know, two diametrically opposed situations, one where a person risks his life, the other who basically says we have to basically think about ourselves and do everything for, uh, for ourselves. The film, in addition to that, is a very multidimensional kind of film. Uh, those of you who had a chance to see it, it portrays various kinds of heroes. A non-Jew who risked her life to save Jews during the Holocaust. As you saw, the man who jumped um, uh, the, by the passing train. Uh, these are the, that kind of a uh, rescue experience is what the Carnegie Foundation uh, honors. And then we also have in the film a man who is raising consciousness about the Israeli treatment of the Palestinian, very similar to those who were resistors during the Holocaust who helped raise the consciousness of what the rise of Nazism is all about. And then we have what is most common in our society, and these are the hedonist heroes. And for more about that, I suggest that you watch Yoav's upcoming film. Then we have, as I said, the two contrasting views of those who want to help and think it's the right thing to do, and the Ayn Rand's of the world who promote uh, that people should just be doing for, for themselves. In modern culture, heroes to most youngsters are not those who engage in acts of kindness or saving a life today. Today, we have the movie actor, the sports star, the charismatic spiritual leader, the supermodel, the rich and the famous. Those are the ones that are emulated by our children today. And in fact, both ends of the film point to this modern hedonistic culture, the Kardashians, if you will. And uh, we will discuss, discuss the other dimensions of the film later. So why don't we discuss, why don't we begin our conversation, uh, Yoav and Yohanan and Mordechai, uh, by um, my asking you, you know, what's a hero? So who goes first? You, you can go first. So I want to say, uh, when I first came to Yad Vashem in 1982, and I, I was appointed head of the Righteous Among the Nations Department, uh, I was a little bit surprised because I had studied the Holocaust 
And I had only studied, you know, the bad side of the Holocaust, a lot of bad and evil, of course, but I have never heard of people risking their lives to save Jews, especially in countries like Poland, where anti-Semitism was so strong. And here I was put in charge, and people cautioned me at Yad Vashem, oh, you know, you're not going to last long at Yad Vashem because you're going to find a few good people, and uh, within a year it's going to be over. Uh, they'll close the department. And uh, it didn't happen that this. More and more stories came forth, more, thousands more were added to the list of the righteous. And it's uh, very strange. These are people, they, these are not the regular altruists like Mother Teresa who go out to India to try to help. Uh, people like Mother Teresa made a, a rational decision based on maybe on religious consideration, but they decided they want to devote their lives to help others. Uh, in opposition to what Anne Rant uh, claims uh, should be a person's behavior. Uh, uh, most people do behave like Anne Rant for most parts of their lives. I think what she left out is that uh, most people also do acts of goodness for others. It's a mixed bag. But in the Holocaust, it's uh, something different. In the Holocaust, it's helping people who were condemned to death for no reason whatsoever. The only reason is because they were born or because their grandparents were Jewish and helping these people to stay alive while at the same time risking your own life. So it's not only a matter of inconvenience, you're playing with your life and the life of your family. And yet there were so many people, I'm not saying millions, but in the tens of thousands, literally in the tens of thousands all over Europe, who when, it, when they were challenged, to do something like that, somehow we're able to overcome the fear and somehow we're able to respond positively in spite of the fact that many of these people were also, uh, uh, also held to some anti-Semitic tropes. It's not that they liked the Jews very much, but they felt that every person has a right to live. And if a person's life is being challenged simply because he was born, uh, then uh, you are also challenged. Maybe you'll be next in line because uh, nobody has a right to simply decide who is to inhabit the, this planet Earth or not. Uh, the other thing I discovered from my uh, studies of the uh, rescues of the Jews, most rescues of the Jews did not take the initiative. It, they responded to a call of help. In most cases, not all, but in most cases, it's the persecuted Jew who comes up to the door of someone he may have known from before the war. He has escaped from the ghetto. He has escaped from a camp. He knocks on the door. Hi, how are you? Can I stay here overnight? And facing him is a man, maybe with a sandwich in his uh, hand over dinner. And he has to make an on the spot decision whether to allow him in to spend that one night or not. And he knows if he says no, that man outside would probably be apprehended, shot, deported to a camp. If he says yes. You're saying that it's the situation that, that it's brought the situation. Out, brought and out. those people then acted instinctively on the spot. So it's not like Mother Teresa. They didn't sit back and said, oh, I'm going to try to help a Jew and so on. And I'm going to look out where there are Jews on the run. It happened in a face-to-face -face confrontation, an eye-to-eye -eye confrontation. And that is the great mystery and the great beauty of the story. And Yoav, now you've interviewed not just those who rescued during the Holocaust, but other situations. And, and what, what would you say is, what is a hero? Well, that's, that's what the film is about. So for like 90 minutes, we try to figure it out for different type of heroes. Uh, so someone uh, like Wesley Autry, the subway hero, who just happened to be in a situation, doesn't think for a second, and he's doing that. You have more kind of like you have the, uh, the freedom fighter from South Africa, uh, who took a conscience decision to go against uh, her own group, the, the other whites that she was part of, and decided to go against them and fight alongside uh, the ANC uh, to uh, liberate, to do what 
she thought was right. So like, I mean, there's like different, different type of heroes. And in the film, we try to see if there's kind of like a common, the, the, the uh, kind of common traits that kind of like... Uh, okay, we will, we will get to the common traits later. So why don't we begin by... Uh, uh, Yoav, why don't you tell us a little bit about what was the impetus for you in making this film? Okay, so actually the film started with um, uh, Professor Zimbardo and an Israeli scholar who approached me and uh, they told me about this uh, research they're doing uh, about people who transformed. So they were like talking about two group of people. Uh, one was uh, Israeli and Palestinians who decided to uh, to cooperate, that uh, the army or uh, the way of uh, armed struggle is not is not the right way, uh, and to find um, a common language with the other. So this was one group, and the other one was uh, uh, former gang members in the U.S. Uh, who quit the gangs and turned against the, the gangs, which is a very difficult thing. So they were kind of interested in finding out what makes these people transform. So that was kind of like the initial, the initial uh, idea, and then that was kind of like leading us with the film onwards to, to different type of heroism and different situations. Okay, and then you went on your journey and you call your film uh, the Ten Percent. So one of the things that surprised me is that in Milgram, and I was a student of the late Stanley Milgram is that in his obedience to authority study, it was 33 and a third percent of the individuals who did not obey the experimenter in order to harm the, uh, the students in the experiment. So I'm wondering where you got the 10%. And the other, uh, just a point of information is that Milgram's uh, family was not a Holocaust related family. The family had come from Hungary a long time ago. And that, in fact, what motivated him to do the obedience to authority study was the Eichmann trial. So he was a, you know, a college uh, student and saw the trial and, and uh, decided to think about what, uh, you know, what made people go along with, you know, killing the Jews. Yeah. Uh, so, the, so the number 10% actually came from Zimbardo, who, uh, I mean, you can decide not to participate in it, but you can also decide to actively oppose it. Uh, so there was like a minority of people who, who Zimbardo estimated at 10% that opposed the, the Milgram experiment. Um, so this is where the number comes from. So it's not yeah, just... Okay. So I guess there's a machlok and a division between Zimbardo and Milgram. Could be. And so I prefer, I prefer Milgram in that at least we feel like a third of the people, if they're put into a situation, uh, would do the right thing and not harm another person. So but, I, I, would like, uh, I would like to add something here. Uh, uh, the Mil both the Milgram and the Zimbardo test show us uh, that people who uh, participate in acts of evil, whether, or they, uh, whether they agree with it or not, are always, or in most cases, are people who are at the behest of others. They're part of a group. They take orders. So there is just that social pressure, which is important. Whereas people who rescue Jews were individual persons who made an individual decision, and most of them, they were not at the behest of others, because if they had asked others whether to do it, they would have said, no, you're risking your life. They were at the behest of themselves. That's the other right. thing I want to point out is the similarity between the rescuers and that man who jumped on the subway tracks. Both rescuers and this uh, person, they knew, if I don't do it, no one else is going to do it. That's you standing in front of me. If I turn him away, I, I can't tell him, go, go down the street and knock on another door and things like that. It's not going to work. It's either I respond positively or not, or no one else. The same thing with that man standing people, on the tracks. He knew he had people. to make an immediate decision. He could not say, I'll think it over, or I'm going to ask somebody else what to do because the train is approaching. So there is some similarity between these two. Right, so you're talking about one of the characteristics of, the, uh, of a hero or rescuer 
is that these are individuals who are independent thinkers and are not affected by social pressure. They are and independent that, thinkers. That brings us, wait, wait, wait. That brings At that us particular to moment, us, they are independent thinkers. Maybe. To, uh, uh, to Yoav, uh, the picture that you found of the, uh, of the one guy who does not go Heil Hitler where everybody else does. How did you find that picture? And do you know anything that happened to this one individual who did not say Heil Hitler? Yeah, so this picture was kind of like, uh, was very uh, popular on, on Facebook, you know, all of a sudden I ran across it and I thought, okay, this is an interesting picture, you know, um, and why this guy? What, what makes him different? Assuming he was just not like uh, tired at the moment and just putting his arm to rest, you know, because that could also be a possibility, right? So when everybody's going like that, it could go like that. But I mean, assuming he was like making a, making a point. So I thought this is like a very courageous point to make. We tried to look for him. You can find all sort of information on Wikipedia about who he is or who he isn't. Uh, but actually we've done kind of like uh, quite uh, thorough research and we couldn't uh, say uh, in a very uh, definite way who he was. So there is stuff you can find on Wikipedia about him. Uh, but it's it's kind of like it's uh, it's not one hundred percent sure. Uh, and um, let's begin with uh, trying to dissect a couple of the different uh, rescuers uh, uh, heroes that we have in the film. And uh, Mordechai, why don't we begin with um, my asking you about the rescuers now, Irena? who uh, became the director of the department after you at Yad Vashem, goes around saying, well, there's no commonalities amongst the rescuers. You know, they're rich and they're poor, they're educated, uneducated, rich, not rich. Uh, uh, what are some of your thoughts about that, having met so many of the rescuers? It's very hard to, to define, uh, to find common denominators. It is very hard. Uh, one thing I want to say about the rescuers of the Holocaust, they did not consider themselves as heroes. Uh, all of them explained very strangely after the war that they did what uh, was a natural thing, what uh, everybody else should have done. They found it very hard to articulate their behavior. Uh, although some of them said, uh, my mother always said, try to help somebody else and so on. Uh, but most of them did not give a very clear, cogent, philosophical, convincing answer to explain. So the mystery is still there. Uh, so as far as common uh, denominator, I would, I would uh, start with the negative. They did not hate people. They did not hate Jews as Jews. Uh, they, they had a, a certain measure of tolerance. Uh, they were not people who would expressly go out and risk their lives for something, but when challenged, uh, there was something in them, some impulse, which said, I can't say no, I got to find a way. I have to add, most people who admitted Jews in their home, uh, they didn't say, all right, you can come in and stay for two years. No, it didn't happen like this. You want to stay overnight, come in and have something to eat, and then uh, we'll figure something out. Maybe I can send you someplace else to a friend. And then one day turned to two days and three days and four days. And uh, when, when they saw that uh, they were stuck with that Jewish person or, or several Jewish person, then they dis decided to, to dig a bunker under the house. Uh, they figured out ways. They found that they, they added strength and courage to themselves. They right. found out that they could do it. In other right. words, in other words, Yoaf, they found out you don't have to be a hero, you can simply be a mensch. And, and being a mensch, uh, and that is the heroism of simply being a mensch. Right. Well, you, you, raise, you, raise many of the, uh, you raise many of the findings that I found. I'm a social psychologist uh, who spent quite a few years um, researching why non-Jews rescue Jews during the Holocaust. And, um, and like uh, Zimbardo and Berger who went to try to interview these people, uh, what I did when I did a sequential narrative of these people's lives, uh, I found uh, 
there are three, as a social psychologist, you have to look at it at the individual in terms of their particularly socialization, their family background, you have to look at their personality, and you have to look at the situation and how these three interact together. And so one of the things, the, the most important thing as, as Mordechai brings out is that uh, as children, these individuals learn a tolerance and acceptance of people who are different. And, um, uh, and then the other uh, that you found in their family upbringing is that they, had, they came from a very loving home. They came from parents who about 80% of them, which psychologically when you do something, a research study is quite a bit, uh, to uh, have an, a person, either their parents or somebody who was influential in their life who was altruistic and that they engaged them in the altruistic activities as well. Also, the parents were individuals who were not uh, punitive. In those days, if a child did something wrong, it was very common to punish the child, to hit the child. These children grew up with parents who were much more didactic and they help children undisplained. And that is part of what helped them become independent thinkers and not have to go along with the norm of the group. And then uh, many of them did have a loss in early childhood. We have to remember many of the rescuers grew up during World War I. They had to move, things were, you know, there were bombardments, uh, they lost a, a brother, they lost a father. Uh, in, in the war, and they had somebody who helped take care of, uh, who helped take care of them. When it comes to the personality, like Mordechai had said, these were not people who were, um, who were suicidal in terms of the risk that they were taking. They had a feeling that they will be able to succeed. They had the courage to do it. There were many rescuers, as Mordechai says, Somebody came, they stayed at their house for one night, they realized that they cannot uh, withstand the fear that it took and they said, sorry, you gotta leave. And these rescuers continued to have the courage. They were not as afraid to continue to do that. And then as Mordechai says, the situation. So the situation, you have to be in a position to be able to help. So in many of the cases, Mordechai says individuals, non-Jews were asked by Jews to help and then they made that, uh, and then they made uh, that decision. I'd like to add so, something more, that uh, to sure. be a rescuer, to be a good person, it doesn't mean you have to be free from all prejudicial and stereotypes about the other person, uh, but you can control it. In other words, you may continue to think that uh, the Jews are hoarding uh, gold and they are only interested in money. You can have all these things, but if you can control it and see the human being behind that, then you can do a good deed. So you don't have to be a total saint. The other thing I want to add, when I studied the Jewish rescuers, here the situation is different. Jewish rescuers initiated and made decisions. They decided, I want to help my fellow brothers and I'm going to look for ways. So either I'm going to join an organization or like OS, OSA in France and so on. So that's the big difference between Jewish rescuers and, uh, and non-Jewish right. rescuers. Uh, and uh, in Poland, there was one organization called Zygota. That was a decision by the Polish underground to create an organization specifically to help Jews. But all others that we dealt with at Yad Vashem were individual persons who made individual lonely decisions. They didn't belong to any club of rescuers. They, they didn't exchange uh, ideas with other rescuers and so on. They made, it was a personal decision between themselves and, uh, and, uh, and their, their own thinking. And that is the beautiful part of it. And uh, that is something that I would have asked the person in the Anne Rand Institute, how to figure out these people. Are they normal? Are they abnormal? Uh, this is something I would like to hear their response to that. There were individual cases where a, uh, where a rescuer was an anti-Semite and, uh, and they forewent that particular feeling and then after the war went on to continue to be anti-Semites, but it was during that particular situation exactly. that, they, 
they uh, that they went on. So Yoav, I'd like to get back to the uh, the other dimensions that you talk about. So as you're trying to understand, you know, what makes a hero, you go from the evolutionary to the biological to the neurological and psychological point of view to try to figure it out. And it seems to me that all of these different dimensions were very disappointing. So what, what do you conclude? No, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a film, so it's also it's supposed to be a little bit entertaining. So finding the Holy Grail or this kind of like secret ingredient is always, is a good, is a good cause, is a good motivator to go on a search. But I want to go back for a second on this kind of like, uh, on the political aspect of this uh, righteous Gentile. And I think uh, one of the beautiful things about uh, the department that Mordechai started has to do with the very complicated political aspects of uh, Israel and the Holocaust, which started off as, uh, as the, the, the Sabras being very upset about the victims, about the Jews that, uh, that managed to survive, they did not fight enough, uh, they went uh, to the slaughter and you know, this type of, uh, of things. And then there was this kind of like um, um, uh, ideas about anti-Semitism, which in, in a way it's kind of like uh, it was reinforcing uh, a lot of the Israeli politics uh, to think that Israel is a safe haven for Jews. And in order to, um, to uh, emphasize this, this idea, so you have to have anti-Semites around you. So al almost in a way, uh, it's almost like an insult tell a, a Jewish person that not everybody hates him. But for me, as, a, as an Israeli, it's very encouraging to learn about uh, the righteous Gentiles and to know that it wasn't just uh, one unifying uh, uh, anti-Semitism and everybody was kind of like cooperating with the Nazis. So for me, actually, as, uh, Absolutely. as an Israeli, it's, uh, it's really great and I'm really grateful for Mordechai to, to kind of like uh, put the light on these people because I think it's, it's, it's so important that we know there are human beings all around us and people are essentially good and uh, look for the, the, the better side in humans is always better than to look for the, for the, for the fear and for the hate. So I think, I think Mordechai, it's, it's great that, you know, this, uh, this department telling these stories is really important also for us, for Israelis, to kind of like gain the sense of normality that is so missing. Well, I think you're right. I think it's something that I think all Jews need to understand. And one of the uh, one of the important things is that whenever you have a situation of victims and oppressors, there will all be rescuers. And that's why when you film in South Africa and you see the woman who you know who risked her life. Uh, for uh, for the, the for the Africans in in Africa, uh, that is you know a very good example of that. You have that example in Darfur and uh, and all the other all the other uh, situations as well. I'd like to move us to another point, which has to do with transforming moments uh, in Schindler's List. Uh, many of you remember, you know, he begins as being a womanizer, a drunkard, uh, people, you know, who's a conniver, uses the Jews to, uh, to enrich himself. And then he has this transforming moment when the Jews are liquidated from the Krakow ghetto and are going to be deported to concentration camps. He, uh, uh, um, Steven Spielberg does a beautiful thing where it's all black and white and then there's a girl with a red coat, if many of you remember that. And that's his transforming moment where he says, you know, I'm going to help these individuals. And then he spends a lot of his own money uh, buying each one of these Jews. And um, what happens is uh, he has this transforming moment. I'm wondering, Yoav, whether in your interviews with some of the, uh, the rescuers, did you feel that there was, um, uh, that, that individuals had some kind of a transforming moment that moved them from an ordinary person to a, uh, to, to a hero? So, I mean, actually the only uh, writer gentleman that I interviewed uh, is Orlette, that unfortunately had passed away. So this is, she's the woman 
in the film. So for her, there was, uh, she said it was obvious and she was a young woman at the time. So there wasn't such thing. But the interesting point, which we see later in the film, because we kind of like, we follow this research uh, and then we, um, um, we have these Israelis and Palestinians who transformed and then Jonathan Shapira, uh, who's a former combat pilot in the Israeli Air Force, who decided to lead a rebellion against the Air Force. And that was during the, the bombing of Gaza. And he kind of like, uh, it's a very, very difficult thing to do, to go against your own army, uh, to disobey orders, to disobey the, the um, everyone around you, basically, and to say what we are doing is wrong. And for him, he was, he was talking about this transformative moment where he was, flying to Gaza and he knew what he was going to do there, which was not very, you know, humane. And on the way he passed above, he was a helicopter uh, a pilot. And on the way he passed above um, um, this place was a wedding and he saw all the people dancing and, you know, there was this uh, big uh, outdoor wedding. And then he, he, he passed above this wedding and five minutes later he was in Gaza this kind of like uh, life in Israel versus life in Gaza, what he was actually being part of, that really struck him uh, as, you know, this, this type of um, uh, contradiction, these very different places, the fact that on one side people can be happy and on the other side, he himself is going to lead uh, devastation to the people I mean, he uses very strong words which are in the film, which many of us are not comfortable listening to. Uh, I know that many American Jews are very are having hard time with uh, um, with seeing Israelis who opposed the government, who opposed the regime, uh, who are being considered very leftists. Um, but I mean, th this is a, yeah, this is a whole different type of like. Right, so you bring, you bring it to, you, you like bring it to where I want to bring the discussion now, which has to do with, uh, we're talking about different kinds of, uh, of heroes. So one hero is the rescuer that we've been talking about, which is helping an individual. And then we have the people who were in the resistance. So in the Holocaust, we had the resistance. We're talking about, for example, like the White Rose Group, for example. So these are not individuals who necessarily help individual people, but that they raise consciousness about what is going on. So Jonathan Shapiro is one of these individuals who is raising consciousness about what Israelis are doing with the Palestinians. And what's interesting about Jonathan, as we were talking earlier about what are some of the influences that we have, Jonathan's mother volunteers to help Ethiopians and Russians. She takes in about, or she deals with about 75 of them. And Yonatan as a child is involved in helping all these. So this might be something that, you know, have left an impression on him in terms of one, a tolerance for people who are different. And the other also is, you know, helping another, another individual. And that, that was part of of who he is and that when he saw the inhumanity that, you know, he might have to perform, he just felt that he, um, that he could not, that he could not do that. Um, Eva, let me jump uh, in here because there's a very active discussion going on in the chat box and I see the time advancing. I want to make sure to get in some of these voices, if that's okay with you. All right, so, but I just have one very important thing, which I want to end with here, which is, Yoav, uh, in terms of yourself, that you've been going through this whole trip of, you know, trying to find out, you know, who's a hero? Can I be a hero? Now, in your own family, your grandfather was a military hero. And I am wondering whether this story is something that you grew up with, and this is why you are now grappling with this question and why unconsciously you made the film. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure about that, but I mean, just to kind of like, uh, to conclude my point, I mean, it's just uh, a lot of the time it's just a matter of being conscious. 
it's all about that, you know, like for me as well, when I was making this film, I saw just like being in the filming and the editing for so long, because it takes a long time to, to make a film. I was feeling this transformation within myself. So I was aware, I was aware of the choices that I could make. And uh, I, I kind of like, I decided to a lot of the time to kind of like quit the, the autopilot of indifference and do something. It might be small things. It could be like uh, help me, helping a, a homeless guy, I don't know, like uh, get off the street or if I saw a car getting stuck on the road or very small things, but I was just aware. I wasn't blind to them. And I think a lot of these times you just, it's, it's just a bit about being conscious about what's going on around you. And a lot of the time we're unconscious. I grew up in Israel uh, at a time that all I kept hearing from the other side is that Israel must be destroyed, exterminated, the Jews pushed in the sea. I participated in the Six Day War. On the eve of Six Day War, I kept hearing music from the Arab uh, stations, Itbach el Yahud, uh, Slaughter the Jews. And uh, they were talking about uh, another Holocaust. And uh, well, it didn't turn out like this. So I am not against helping. Now, in the Gaza Strip, we have a government that refuses to recognize Israel, calls for Israel's destruction, launches bombs into Israel, hits cities as far as Ashdod and Ashkelon. So I'm not saying we have to punish the, the civilians in Gaza, but it's more of a political issue. And I don't want to compare that to what happened in the Holocaust. The Jews in the Holocaust did not threaten Germany. They didn't ask for, they didn't call for Germany's extermination and so forth. So it's a whole different ball game here. And I'm happy when I read that Israel is allowing people from Syria to cross the border and get medical attention, or people in the Gaza Strip who need an operation, they're allowed to be in Israel, they're taking Israeli hospitals. I'm all for humanitarian help, but I don't know whether the solution of the, in the Gaza Strip is simply to overlook the political background of this. It's okay. a little bit more complicated. I, I, don't think I, we're gonna solve, now. I don't think we're gonna solve the Middle East Right, but no, I don't want anybody to but, think that we're comparing <laughs> what's happening between the Israelis and the Palestinians and the Holocaust. That I should not be anything okay. that we're saying. We are just saying, how do we treat another human being? Of course. That's right. Okay. So That's let's fine. bring in some of the voices from the chat box because we have about 15 Thank minutes you. left. So there's quite a bit of discussion over the fact that 9-11, uh, which was just a couple of days ago, and of course, 9-11 was a cataclysmic catastrophe, but there were also helpers, there were also heroes. So I'm wondering if you can also comment on 9-11. Let me just bring you, give you a few different questions and then our speakers can answer what they want. There's someone, so 9-11 is one thing to, that um, people are asking about. Number two is, uh, is there or is there not a gene for altruism? And number three that Eva actually spoke to was the role of organizations as opposed to individuals. Because if somebody is a member of a rescuing organization, then who's the hero? Is it the organization? Is it the individuals? So those are questions popping up. So who would like to address I believe that, that there is a gene for altruism. I believe that every person is capable to be an altruist. The big difference is if you are a Nazi, you, you are an altruist on, only for fellow Nazis, for fellow uh, people. The big thing is to be an altruist for people for the other, with the capital O. The people, he's the outsider. He is not like you. And to become an altruist and try to, to see the other person in the image of a human being. So it's not enough. Everybody, everyone has got that gene. Everyone, uh, society would not exist if people did not help out each other. Uh, so the uh, altruistic gene as well as the egoistic gene exists, okay? Uh, but the, the big thing, uh, both during the Holocaust and even with the Arab-Israeli conflict is to see the human side of those that are on the, up, on the other side of the fence, the other, the other person who is not like you, who is different than you, socially, religiously, economically, politically. That is the big thing. That is the big thing. Uh, Yo, you're the one who interviewed the uh, the big gene guy. Yeah, so I think for those who haven't seen the film, it, it will make like, uh, it's easier to, to see the film and uh, get like it from the, from the source. But uh, yeah, eventually, you know, it's always this kind of like uh, nature versus nurture discussion 
which is very prevalent in, uh, in social psychology. Absolutely. So I think nowadays, I think most scientists tend to the, to the nurture. So, I mean, uh, education can change even genetics. So even if you're born, let's say, with not the best genes in terms of altruistic or not, it's kind of like, it's, it's a little bit of a, you know, it's a very vague, you know, like nobody really understand it uh, precisely, but I mean, education will take you further than, than anything else. Thank you, I, I couldn't agree more. So what about, what, about, what, about, what about 9-11? Does anybody have comments about the hero? Yeah, what I would like to say about 9-11 is that I've done a lot of work with Native Americans. And there were Native Americans from the Pine Ridge Reservation who came all the way from South Dakota. They drove themselves. They had to raise the funds to get mo enough money for the gas to come because they were iron workers and they came and helped uh, to try to rescue as many people who might still be who might still be alive. That's what I'd like to say about 9/11. Question for Yoav. L lighter question. Your film is wonderful, film filled with humor and insight. Congratulations. How long did it take to make from beginning to end? Oh, it's always, it's always uh, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit how long it takes to make films because eventually you watch them for 90 minutes and uh, sometimes it's three, four, five years. So this one's like probably on average of three, four years. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I tend to take complicated subject, I think, and uh, I take my time. So uh, you, you can check my website, it's just youhavshamir.com, it's very easy. And um, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a lot of work. So um, we have six minutes left or five minutes left. Maybe it's time to go to, for some final thoughts to our speakers. So who would like to go first with some final thoughts? Uh, I want to ask you off uh, in, in that film and in the other film, uh, uh, you always start with your grandmother. You had a special relationship with your grandmother? Above everyone else in the family? Actually, I did. She, she passed away uh, a few years ago. She was almost 100. She just was like oh. missing to the 100. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't have her now for my new films. Uh, at the time, we were kind of like making jokes that we should just like make a lot of interviews with her while she's still uh, alive and sharp and, uh, for whatever future projects. But uh, yeah, it's just a... Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a way to kind of like, uh, sometimes with film, you just need to kind of like give the audience a cue, what type of like, what is the tone of the film? So in this sense, it's kind of like, it's, it hints, it's like, it's a personal, it's lighthearted. So um, I'm, I'm bringing you into my life. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a good way to, to go inside. Um, in, in this film, she was kind of like not as, uh, uh, controversial as maybe in other films, which was she was much more controversial for the I think for the audience in her comments. Um, but yes, and, and then also going back to this type of like situation, which is I think what Zimbardo was trying to say, what Eva was talking about before. So I made a thing called checkpoints, which you mentioned before, and nice. I had long talks with Zimbardo about it, about how the situation forces you into something. So I don't think it's kind of like uh, it's a few bad apples or it's uh, it, just some situations in which you're put into, they just bring the, the worst of you in you. It's kind of like it's uh, when you think about like these young soldiers, whether it's in Abu Ghraib, maybe it's in, uh, uh, in Israel and Palestine. So they put in very difficult situations and they, they kind of like, the situation is so um, not in control, it's so difficult uh, that it brings, it just brings things from you. So it's not like uh, the, the power of the situation is extremely strong. I think it's much stronger than a lot of people uh, realize. You mentioned uh, Oscar Schindler. I dealt very strongly in the Oscar Schindler case, very complicated. Uh, Oscar Schindler was not cut out to be an altruist. He came to Poland. Uh, to make money uh, uh, on the account of the slave labor. 
He was a carpetbagger. He was a member of the Nazi party. He was not a Nazi at heart. But then when he came there and he saw the situation, he saw the brutality, he saw these Jewish people that were dependent on him for continue to live and something happened and he was trans, the, the transformation took place there in Krakow. Not, so he, he still remained a womanizer, but that's, that's okay. But he became right. a, a rescuer. And uh, even maybe you met uh, Marion Pritchard. Marion Pritchard, uh, she saved a lot of Jews in Holland, and she was a, psycho a psychoanalyst in Vermont. And she wrote that uh, when she was a student in, uh, in Amsterdam, and one day she was on her way to school, and she saw the Nazis picking up children and throwing them into a truck. This brutality, this... Uh, yeah, she had a transforming moment. That, yes. So I want to add with the observation that was made with Helen Fine. Helen Fine, who wrote about the universe of obligation, that uh, uh, the circle of people in society to whom obligations are all, to whom rules apply. And uh, when there was uh, uh, injuries are, uh, are made to that universe of obligation, then the, uh, that calls for a response. So the Jews were placed outside the universe of obligation. These are people... Right. To home. And that's, I think, what prompted the rescue to say, no, they are within my universe of obligation and I will help. So Heroes as good people who do good deeds. Uh, but I'm wondering, uh, there are some heroes in our midst that maybe are doing it for self-aggrandizement. And uh, Yoav, your next film about Rael, the leader of the UFOs, strikes me as strikes me as such a man i mean that you know everything has gone to his head in terms of all the people that are that are followers of this leader of the ufos and yeah. can uh, can a hero be somebody who uh people uh, people think he's a hero but he is very much involved in you know in his own self-aggrandizement yeah well that's kind of like uh a new film, a little bit of a different topic. It's more about how religions evolves and the, the role and what happened when, like you said, what happened when crazy people do good things. But you know, when I, I just want to get back to something, I, I will look for the exact quote, but uh, when we looked for like a quote, because we wanted to make t-shirts for the film for 10% what makes a hero. And then we found this beautiful quote from Bertolt Brecht. And he said, um, I, I can look, let me look for the exact quote. He said like, something like, uh, um, happy is a place which needs no heroes, something like that. I, I will look for the for the for the exact quote in, in a second. So I mean, personally, I would like to live in a place where we don't need the heroes, where it's a peaceful society, and uh, I mean, just uh, the heroic thing might be just to help someone carry the the bags of groceries. So I mean, uh, better play. Better live in a place where you don't need the heroes. I think this is like a good sign where you're living in such a place. Okay, and what I would like to end with is asking uh, my, my two discussants here, you know, we have this audience here and one of the things we're trying to do is how do we create individuals who are, you know, who are rescuers like those in the Holocaust, those who are part of the, the Carnegie Foundation heroes, the resistors, uh, amongst us, uh, how do we instill that as role models for young people today? How do we make that much sexier? And is that possible that we can possibly compete with the heroes of the Kardashians of the world? Show them the story of a person like Irena Sendler. Irena Sendler, a plain, That's petite person, who saved hundreds of children. She started by saving one, two, three, four, five, and then she saved hundreds. Uh, if she can do it, uh, you don't have to be like her, but if she, uh, you can also do a small good deed. She is not a heroic type of person, but she did heroic deeds. So that's a beautiful story, the Irena yes. Sandler example. Irena Sandler, thank you who rescued uh, about two and a half thousand children in Warsaw. No, not two and a half thousand, but hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Yes, many, right. many. And Yoav? I think, I think it's just a matter of understanding that there is a choice, that when you're in a situation, you can help, you cannot help. It's, it's a matter of choice. Everything That's we right. do, we have a choice. And I think it's, it's very easy to, uh, to forget it, but we do actually have a choice 
me. And uh, some of the heroes that I spoke with in the film, they just like the, it was also a very simple kind of like uh, uh, theorization, but said, I could not not do it. So it, it, they couldn't live peacefully within themselves. It was just, even, even if you could look at it as, as an egoistic type of act, you know, I, I couldn't live with myself knowing that I did not help this person. I did not reach out. I had a choice. I didn't, I didn't exercise this choice, this option. So really it's just a matter of, of being conscious. And I just want to add this exact phrase because it's a beautiful one. It says, unhappy the land that is in need of heroes. That's by Bertolt Brecht. Very good. Very beautiful. <laughs> And I would like to I would like to add that I, we can't create a rescuer or a resistor, but we can increase the propensity to go do to do good. And for that, I think we need good parents who are loving. We need parents who are significant role models who also engage their children in helping behavior in act or in resistance activities. And we also need parents who teach their parents by their children by example of tolerance and acceptance of people who are different. We need parents who are didactic, who teach their children by explaining things rather than uh, emotional, physical, or psychological abuse. And, um, and I think that by doing that, we will enable a child to become more independent and less fearful of malevolent authorities whether it's an individual authority or whether they're in a group situation, they can begin to think for themselves. And with that, I'd like to turn it over uh, to Olivia to uh, say goodbye to everybody. And I wanna wish everybody a happy and healthy new year. And I hope that maybe by uh, Simchat Torah, uh, Israel will uh, not be on lockdown and everybody will be able to dance with the Torah. Can I add, Shippi, a quote? You quoted Brecht. I want to quote Hillel. If I am not for myself, then who is for me? And if I am only for myself, then what am I worth? And if not now, then when? Thank you. Thank you, Mordechai. And thank you, Noah. It's been great to have a discussion with the two of you. My thanks to our three speakers today um, from all different time zones. Uh, my thanks to all of you for joining, you, joining us. Of course, uh, I also add my own wishes for a sweet, happy, healthy new year to all who, uh, who follow the Jewish custom. And we will see you after the Jewish high holidays. We're going to have a, a fabulous second season planned for you of programs. So please look out uh, for that in your emails. And thanks for spending this time with us. Have a nice rest of, rest of your day, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>